You're ruining my flow. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm joined today remotely from Southern California by our buddy George Hamill uh, of the Dirt Life Show, and he brought a special guest with uh with him today, and uh, we're going to get into that. Um, but first, George uh, Ryan, welcome to the show. Glad to have you guys on. Yeah, what's up, man? How are you? Good to always be on the show, Zach. Thank you. Um, so you guys just got back from Baja, right? We did. So, uh, yeah, Ryan is, uh, well, a podcast guy and a media guy himself. And he w- came to Baja. We had the opportunity to do some media stuff down there and he was able to come down and help out, dude. He was a crucial part of everything that happened. It was pretty cool to see that. I think media is actually just really, I don't know, in my opinion, starting to kick off, uh, lately for off-road. So one of the things that I've been saying for a long time is that our industry for it to really kind of like get to that next level. Uh, we really have to have really good coverage of the events of the things that are going on, the races and the, and the community events and all those things. Um, you know, when you talk about like, uh, rally cross or, um, a lot of the European racing series, uh, they didn't really take off until the media got involved and the, the network started putting camera ops on all the different corners and, uh, guys talking on mics, you know, back at HQ and all that stuff. The, the sports don't really progress until the mass audience has a way to consume it. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, like Ryan, it does a lot of stuff with motocross. Don't you think it's kind of the same? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's, I think it's hard for any sport to grow without, you know, a, a, an option for a mainstream audience. Uh, you know, even just in the sense that when you have all the cameras there and the interviews happening and, you know, there's a lot of media involved. It makes everything feel more legit. Everybody's a little bit more hyped on it. And uh, I think it just opens up a lot of doors with, you know, social media being as big as it is nowadays as well. Yeah, totally. And Zach, I think it like, it makes a big difference too. Cause like you see like F1 had that Netflix series, I think it's called drive to survive or whatever it is driven to survive. Like stuff like that really needs to happen in the dirt world to be able to make it so that it's mainstream. Like, uh, my personal goal in uh, in all this is to like be able to walk up to a person inside Walmart and be like, "Hey, do you know what off road racing is? Have you ever seen Baja 1000?" And they answer yes instead of no because right now nobody knows what it is. Yeah, when I was uh, growing up as a kid, I I was born and raised in Yuma, Arizona, which is like literally kind of like the gateway for a lot of the guys going down to Baja and, and those areas out. In, if you're not in California. Um, but my entire life, I never even knew it existed or it was happening or that there were trucks that could go do these things or anything until I was older and was like, Oh, holy crap, Baja exists. That would be cool to go see. And literally was like a stone throws away from my house was the border to go, to go check it out. But I never knew about it growing up. So marketing has a huge, a huge part of all this. Um, but, uh, let's, let's circle back on that in just one second. You went down there to cover the event for various different people. Would you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, I had Ryan come down and help us because I needed more hands on the on cameras and things like that. And he does such a great job. But we had the opportunity to go down with uh, Scanlon Motorsports Group, which is the factory Polaris Razor racing team. And uh, Craig Scanlon, the owner of that team, had uh, talked with me a few months uh, beforehand about doing a live stream. And we kind of talked about the media and social media and getting into it. But live is much, much different than produced. Uh, it's a much more intricate situation. You really have to be on top of things. And there's a lot more technology that you have to rely on to be able to produce something like that. Um, so we started the process a couple months ago to be able to put something together for him. We had, uh, we just wanted to cover the event in a different way, right? Like make you be a part of the race that's going on instead of just watching the race. So we had decided that we were going to, uh, put three cameras in a helicopter three cameras in a race car and two ground cameras with the chase crew and go around and tell those stories. And we had a lot of time, right? Like there's uh, basically six hours, I think of daylight on Friday. Was it right? Yeah. And then about the same, maybe five or six hours on Saturday. And then the rest is night racing. So we wanted to capture as much as we could like capture behind the scenes uh, going through the chase of it the racing part of it where you see the car and everything go around and then you can see the overall overview of the commentating and everything from the helicopter and it was really cool to me 
um, we had about a 99% success rate, but that 1%, the Starlinks failed on us. And unfortunately we couldn't get the Starlinks uh, to work when we were moving or in motion. Uh, so we just got to fix that and it's going to be bitching. I've already had a bunch of people uh, uh, re request to know how I did it. I'm not releasing my secrets just yet. <laughs> so one of the things that, that I've noticed is that we as a community have gotten kind of jaded by the Sunday football experience, if, if you know what I mean, where um, we're basically uh, we're watching this highly produced content that is nonstop action. Like if there's a break in the action, it goes straight to somebody talking. If there's a break from that person, it's going straight into an edited piece of content from the previous week. If it's a break from that, it's to a commercial and then straight back into the action. And then, you know, like it just is a nonstop cut of different action pieces for you to consume. Uh, and so when we talk about getting into media creation for our sport, for our community, um, you know, like you said, live is so much different than edited uh, post-produced content. You know, we can... I think we're all content creators. We understand that post-edited content really has the the win because it, it, it it's the vision that we had. Like no matter what, we can kind of edit it down to be the vision we had and make sure that the audience consumes it the way we want to. But when it comes to live, uh, there's so many moving parts, right? Like like if we watch football on Sundays or soccer or, or baseball, even baseball, the slowest sport on, on known to man, uh, there's still a lot of action going on and a lot of people doing a lot of things, right? Uh, when it comes to off-road racing um, specifically or even MX or anything else, um, you know, unless you have a team of people and a, and a TD and, and all these different people that kind of call the shots and call the action and do all the things, um, it can come across as slow. Even though the sport is so fast and things are moving so much, it can come across super slow. And so that's the hard part. That's the magic sauce that makes things work is when we can figure out how to tie all these little things together. Um, and so I know that for you, that was, you know, going to be a big challenge, right? Getting all the camera shots and, and streaming to the internet's one thing, but as far as like putting together a team and approaching it and try to make things interesting, how did you go about doing that? Well, yeah, first of all, thanks for knowing all that stuff. Like that means a lot to me because it makes me understand how much actual work we did. Um, well, first there was about, uh, 250 hours or so of preparation just for this one small event following one race team. But that's why I had Ryan, uh, help out is because he's so good at getting all of that filler stuff ready to go. And then, so obviously we could have him help with all that. I mean, how many, how many shots and edits did you put together throughout the weekend that were going to be filler content tons? yeah um five or six right yeah and then well and you had clips that we could have just injected at any time yeah i mean the amount of content that we had ready for it was terabytes yeah was it was pretty solid and and we also had um all of uh the partners that were associated with it that provided us content like commercials and different filler stuff as well so um in my opinion you know um I always tell everybody, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I really, really think that this could have been a good production, at least for the one individual team, because mostly because of the satisfaction of being able to follow it. And you've never been able to do that down in Baja because it's so remote. One thing that people don't realize is that when we talk about um, produced events, let's just say Super Bowl or, or something like that, um, or even just like NASCAR, you know, there's these um uh, how do i say it? there there's this kind of like reliability built into it like they have fiber networks to provide network traffic and internet across the campus and they have you know various satellite trucks and they have various um point to point wi-fi systems for mobile compute uh camera ops and and all this other stuff um but for the most part you know those types of events are they have a kind of like a central hq or like a, a production trailer and a team and and all these things just kind of feed into that and then they all produce it together um when you're in somewhere like baja or, or a, a desert race in general take the mint for example or any one of those places uh when you're moving you know internet doesn't follow you like <laughs> starlink is is great but it, uh it doesn't necessarily work um as you found out the best in motion when you're next to you know, a three ton helicopter, you know, metal body engine parts and all these other things that are happening. Uh, but that's where the technology is improving and we're getting more options to do things. Um, and you learned from this experience quite a bit, uh, how you're going to handle it, but the option to have a streamable source out in the middle of nowhere 
has really changed the game for teams, for brands, for um, events in general. Uh, what was it kind of your take on on kind of the flexibility given just by technology's progression, but also the community's openness and willingness to do n- new things with media? Yeah, well, I think Ryan and I actually talked about this. I think there's a bunch of stuff to talk about in what you just said. The first thing is in Baja, as Ryan knows very well, there is zero. Like he didn't have cell phone coverage for five days, six yeah, days. The, literally like, the entire time. Yeah, zero, like none. And he was in the middle of the city. He still didn't have cell phone coverage. So like there's no options for connecting whatsoever until Starlink. I mean, like that's super cool that they have that now. The second thing is, is the um, craziness of the production, right? Like, so not to get too technical, but um, all of the devices have to feed somewhere. So we had a network operations center, you know, my buddy, uh, Josh in Texas, that was doing all the switchboard and communicating with the outside world. But when it goes from a camera on the ground in Mexico, it goes through Starlink, it goes to outer space, to a satellite, then it comes back, whichever satellite it picks, then it comes back to California, then it goes to Texas, and then it goes out to YouTube or the rest of the world. Like, it's crazy that all that stuff can happen within 30 to 45 seconds. Like, it's phenomenal to me to see that technology has improved and gone that far. Yeah, so the the interesting thing that um, maybe people don't realize is that you had a team in the States doing all the actual switching and content mixing and and all that stuff for you because you can't necessarily as a ground crew keep the whole entire ball of wax going um 24 7 you have to have a team that can rotate and and do the production side of it and upload it to the internet um but uh so shout out to those guys because they have to sit around in a (laughs) at a desk and and make sure everything's pulled off um and then like you said communication's a hard piece right And, and people don't know that in the media world when you're talking about putting on a show um, you know, comms is a huge part of that, right? There's a, there's a, a guy calling shots. There's a guy communicating, telling people to ask questions where they're going to be, who's finishing now, who's, who's coming up next. All that communication is happening behind the scenes. And you can't really do that when you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have no cell service, right? Like it's hard to even accomplish basic communication over internet when you're trying to tie that whole system up with video feed. Um, so what was communication like for you guys? Like, did you just have a game plan going into, we're going to do whatever we can and, and see what happens or, or was there some sort of game plan for communication between the di- various different teams? I kind of feel like it was both, don't you, Ryan? Like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's sort of a tough one just because with there being no service, there's real, it's really hard to game plan, right? Yeah. Like, you know, that's, that's the biggest factor is not being able to communicate with each other when we're down there. So, you know, getting back to your point, like, I've been on live broadcasts where, you know, we're on a Zoom call for eight hours straight with, yep. you know, a, a director, director yeah. back in, you know, who knows where, and they're setting everything up, you know, when one interview is done, they're letting me and everybody else know exactly what spot to be in next. And, you know, it's what very, camera they're going to be on. Exactly. It's very dialed and very organized. So without having that option, you know, it, it almost makes it nearly impossible to pull off. So, you know, I, for us, like what we ended up doing, Zach, was we ended up uh, having a group text thread. So we had like a, a pretty well thought out plan, but I mean, you gotta be flexible in situations like that. Um, and we had a group text between everybody that was on staff, so to speak. And uh, it was multitasking to the fullest. Like Ryan was sitting in the back, not knowing whether he was going to do live, whether he was going to do static content, whether he was going to do social content. He was just trying to grab as much as possible. I was sitting in the front of the helicopter. uh, Thanks, Derek, from Optic for flying us around. um, With a computer in my hand, monitoring all the servers, all the data that was being transferred in from each uh, camera into the server with just making sure that it was all working good, as well as uh, commentating and using uh, my cell phone connected to the Starlink to be able to text back and forth and direct all of the people um, on what to film next. And they had instructions to be able to send what they wanted the direct, the producer to be able to uh, switch cameras to as well. Like, Hey, I got something cool coming up. I'm going to go interview the guys in the chase truck, or we're going to go stop and get burritos and we want to film that, or, you know, the race car is doing this, let's film that, like whatever it was, it was, uh, I guess flexibility is the key word in that situation. 
Yeah. Yeah. I would say you have to be very willing and knowing that you, it's not going to go as planned, but you have to be very flexible and willing to pull it off in, it, in the moment. It was for sure wild. Had the Starlinks not uh, uh, stopped when we were in motion, it would have been a lot smoother. But man, like I, I think it's going to be so rad when it actually comes to fruition. Yeah, when we talk about Starlink, you know, they came out with their in motion system here relatively not too long ago. Um, and it's, I don't even think it's deployed yet. I don't think people even have them yet. Once they do start getting them, you know, I think that problem is going to get solved. And especially when, you know, the technology gets caught up with the manufacturing of all the aftermarket support for it, right? Like the mounts and the, and the different types of systems that all go along with production. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of this in play. Um, as far as communication goes and, and pulling this off, I mean, what was your guys as, as before you guys even like hit the ground testing and, and running and doing stuff, what was the objective? Like, what was the discussion around? This is what we want to do. It was mostly just to show people what we experienced down there. Like, cause, um, well, Ryan, it was your second or third desert race. I think you said, yeah, that would have been my third. Okay. And then, so like experiencing all that stuff in Mexico, how was it for you? Um, it's, it's insane, especially for somebody like me, like I'm familiar with the motocross world. Um, but this is totally different. So again, the, you know, the live feed thing, I think if it gets dialed and you know, all the, all the pieces get put together for it, it's, it's a game changer because it shows somebody like me you know, the gnarliness that really goes on at Baja. So unlike a normal, you know, broadcast, I think this shows a little bit more of the rawness. Yeah. This shows a little bit more of like, you know, the behind the scenes with the chase trucks and even like the media guys and, you know, the culture. Yeah. I mean, we were filming the whole time we were fueling the heli up and, you know, the, middle of the desert yeah. no service around there's literally nothing around whatsoever and we're filling up a heli yeah and i don't think you would ever get to see anything like that on a normal broadcast yeah so i mean again once this deal gets dialed i mean this is this should be a game changer because this is going to turn somebody like me who isn't super familiar with it into a fan just based off seeing like all the crazy stuff that really does Go, yeah, go so into it. dude, yeah, I agree. And so Zach, two things from what Ryan just said, like um being able to see that, like the when the, when we had the helicopter stop to fuel, we were able to film that. When we had the chase crew um stopped and they were able to get the Starlink with service, we we're able to film that. The amount of of messages and direct uh messages and texts and all that stuff that we got on how cool that was, even though it wasn't a successful broadcast was insane to me. They're like, dude, like, can you figure out how to fix this? Because we want to see more of that. Like, so to me, that's just exactly what off-road needs. Like we need to be able to showcase all this stuff because that's what people want. If they're already wondering about a unsuccessful broadcast, can you imagine how rad it will be when we do have a successful broadcast? Yeah, the the community side of this is kind of really kind of at the the beginning stages of where it can go, right? Like, uh, and especially with trying to do something new like this, it it really has to be kind of it, the chicken egg syndrome really comes up, right? You have to show that it's possible and show it like what it can do before somebody's gonna invest a bunch of money and make it happen like top tier, right? So, um, you know, we we all know like just from watching TV or whatever that top tier production's possible. But, you know, we're not talking about multi-million dollar productions anymore, right? That, I mean, that's reserved for those types of um, uh, consumer events, whereas off-road is very niche and it doesn't have the same, like, capital resources that, you know, like NASCAR or foot NFL has. Um, and so racing just in general, like if we talk about how to become a racer and get a race team going and all that, it's all very organic and community driven and like you know, who you believe in is where companies will put their money behind and people that have good personalities and are able to, to stand up in front of people and talk like um, it's not as corporate as the rest of the media industry is. And I think that the ability to bring content creation to the actual teams and content creation to the actual um, racers and, and people that are involved, the personalities and, and whatnot is really what is different about 
media and off-road, right? Like if we talk about Baja, how many races are out there racing? There's there's probably a couple hundred. Um, and however, however many of those teams don't have $500,000 laying around to put into a media crew and hardware investment and cameras and ops and and all that stuff. Um, and so they're focused on getting the race accomplished. Just finishing the race itself is a huge accomplishment for them. Um, so do you see the same opportunity that I see that is if we, as the technologists side of media can figure this, these little pieces and put them together, that we have an opportunity to really push the, the industry forward. Yeah, I definitely think we do. Um, well, so let me preface that by saying, I think this year was the 55th running of the Baja 1000. So that's 55 times that we as an audience have never been able to see those guys go all the way down and do a Baja 1000 race 55 times. And now maybe on the 56th one next year, we'll have it dialed in enough to finally show everybody that hasn't seen it, what it actually looks like. Wait, so just so that I understand fully, because again, I'm not fully Desert guy. Yeah, I don't. There's a lot of this stuff that I don't know. The Baja 1000 has never been broadcasted. No, they have brought. They have broadcast. They just can't show you the whole thing. They just can't show you all the angles live while it's happening. And it's all post. Gotcha. So they've never actually done a live show from start to finish and showed the the gnarliest parts of the race. That's why it's so cool that we have the opportunity to do it. And I think Score has been trying to do that for the last year or two is try to produce as much live commentary and things as they can, but they can really, you know, with that limited team, they can only cover the the start and the finish. They can't really do all the in-between without a huge investment. And since racing is such a focused niche sport, um, you know, that, that opportunity hasn't been there just because we didn't have tools. Now we have tools and we can actually start putting together, you know, systems that will work in the field, like, like what you're testing out this year. Yeah, exactly. And when talking about the systems and the tools, like I wanted to say this earlier, but um so the starlink systems they do work in motion and they did work in motion when we tested them uh just over three weeks ago when they released the new starlink in motion product they shut off all the other ones from being in motion so that's what fucked us so we couldn't get service in motion anymore because of that terms of service agreement that we had with the in quotes old product now Right. So once once we have the Starlinks that are in motion, we're fine. Yeah, Elon I'm looking forward to it shy. for sure. Yeah, e- Elon, dude, what the fuck, man? <laughs> He's Elon been making no lots of interesting. You're getting the old version for, you know, wait, there's no shot. You're not going to have to buy the new one again. Yeah, <laughs> we need that money. Yeah, we're trying to go to space. It's kind of like the Apple thing. It's like they just released a couple new features that just locks the next two generations out as they go, and eventually you'll just have to upgrade. But uh, but no, I'm totally stoked to uh, to get into the in motion game. I think those are really be an awesome solution, um, especially when you think about just all the industries that can benefit it, not just off road, right? Like, there's a lot of like water type sports and and uh, competitions and things like that that don't really get a whole lot of coverage because you have to fly f- helicopters over the ocean. Like, it just doesn't make financial sense to do so. Um, or or a lot of these like smaller niche things. Like we talk about like a a community that has uh, like there's a, there's a local community up here in the Northwest. They have a jamboree that they do every year where they, people show up, they go trail ride, they go do stuff up in the mountains. There's like no cell coverage. There's no anything out there. And, you know, for the most part, the only people that know about it are the people that go to it. So it's like a very slow growth opportunity for them, but it's kind of an economic driver for this really small community out there where now they have the opportunity to show the world who they are, what they're doing and really change the game for their local economics. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Actually, Ryan and I were talking about some of these similar things, like talking about reality of the rest of the world. Um, When we were driving home from Mexico, like um, we had an unsuccessful broadcast and I was bummed out because I wanted it to be awesome, right? Like I wanted, so I hold myself accountable for it and I want to see it be good. But the reality is we flew around in a helicopter and we did media at a a Baja 1000 race. Like our reality is not bad, right? Um, But think about the Starlink stuff or any type of mobile communication that's given these opportunities to us to do these things, you could put that in a third world country and just set it down in a village 
and give people the opportunity with a couple cell phones, that's going to change the rest of the world. Like it's insane how cool it is. So just understanding that gives us the opportunity to be able to go back, understand the reality of it and give people the opportunity to be able to see these awesome things that we're doing. So speaking of the community side of it, you know, going down to Baja and, and Ryan, you, you probably can talk to this a bit the the culture there and how accepting they are to have people come in and and do cool things in their area of the country which is you know throughout the rest of the year is just a bunch of desert <laughs> desert and cows maybe um you know what was the community atmosphere out there for you guys at, at least for me it was super welcoming i mean me being a film guy um you know it's not very often you can walk into a restaurant or up to random people um, with a camera pointing at them and they're okay with it. Most of the time, people aren't super stoked on that. They were hyped. Yeah, anytime I pointed a camera at anybody down in Mexico for the Baja 1000, any everybody was stoked. Like, it was honestly the best hospitality. Everybody was super nice. Obviously, there's a language barrier there. I know absolutely no Spanish. And everybody Taco. was still super... Taco Spanish, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that qualifies. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I know nothing. And everybody was still super cool. They just know that they have a camera and they're like, yeah. Yeah. Anytime, you know, there are times I wasn't even, you know, actually pointing at the person and they'd be stoked and cheering me on. So, um, and again, as for content, that's exactly what you want, you know, just leading back to what I think the broadcast could be like. The Mexican fans are perfect for filming and content and making stuff look really cool. So, yeah, I mean, I'm half tempted to drive down there next week just to get some tacos and hang out with my fellow Mexican friends again. But <laughs> it was a good time for sure. And understanding that, Zach, like, and being able to give them the opportunity. So, like, when you think about the Baja 1000, there's millions and millions of dollars that come into the Mexican economy during those races. So it's really cool to be able to see that. And that's why the Mexicans or the people in Mexico are so hyped on us coming down there because it, it helps, right? Imagine showcasing all of that. <clears throat> that is what's really going to help because it's going to drive the tourism. It's going to drive the industry. It's going to drive the organizations all from just little racers like us, UTV guys, trophy truck guys, showing how cool it is. That's what excels the entire industry because people are into that. The, yeah, uh, I think the, the Baja 1000 is weirdly, you know, I've been to a bunch of motocross races all over the country and, you know, that one is, they take a lot of pride in, where it is right like everybody down there they look forward to that race they look forward to when the racers come down and yep. and you know i again i it's it's like nothing i've ever seen like the it's like soccer in europe almost yeah like the fans are so hyped about it down there and i mean that's i mean zach they like they take their kids out of school for like a week they take the work off for like a week just to be a part of this yeah, there's there's definitely a culture of of something unique there, and and I think that's awesome. Uh, I mean, where else in the world, you know, are you basically traversing a country um, in an off road race, right? Like it's you're going border to border, basically to the ocean to ocean, um, and they vary the track every year, and everything's a little bit different. But um, it's such a unique culture to be part of something special that is unique to where you are and what you are and and where you live and and all of that, right? Like you talk about um, uh, desert racing, you talk about Vegas, like there's so many races and stuff that happen down in Vegas. And there's so many events that happen down there that it's almost cliche to say, I'm going desert racing, you know, down in Nevada. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of like moto parks where you can be like, yeah, we're going to go race at that park. It's like, well, okay. Yeah. That's where everybody races. Like, it's not really anything special per se. Not that it's a, not a good time, but when you talk about an actual destination experience, like, um, we've talked before about getting you out to maybe one of the takeover events or something like that, where it's, it's, you're going to somewhere unique, doing something fun with a community of people. Like there's a lot of pride in that, a lot of, um, special, unique experiences that you can have in those situations. And something like Baja 
you know, you just say I'm going to Mexico, no one really bats an eye, right? You go to Mexico to rights the Baja 1000, everyone starts getting freaked out, right? Like this is awesome. Um, and so, so definitely something that we need to support more of is that community tie in that what can we do to make everybody's lives better? And, and how can we make this a better experience for everybody? And, you know, cleanup's a big part of that. And, um, you know, resources and, and working with local authorities and all those different things, you know, that we've had a lot of prop problems in the past where, you know, there was lots of traps out on these race courses, right? Like some locals were like, get off my land. I don't want you here. Like, you know, and they would put traps out there for these racers making things unsafe. Um, but you know, shout out to the different race series working with law enforcement and, and the authorities to make sure that everyone has a good, safe experience, um, is super, super important. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, in Mexico, though, dude, it's it's the freaking wild west. Like, <laughs> it's it's so hard to, to even. I mean, there would like we were up in the helicopter. We saw people going backwards on the race course, just trying to get to their house, like in an old beat up car or whatever it was. Like, there's so much stuff that can happen. Um, but again, going back to the the media stuff, like, it, it should all be captured. Like, if that's part of it. Like, it's for me. I just don't. I don't know how to say it other than I want to show it because it's one of those things, right? Like you always tell your buddy that he has FOMO, right? You're like, dude, you missed the sickest party last night. Like it was so rad. I wish you could have been there. Well, that's why I feel coming back from every single race in Mexico. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely an opportunity to, to grow, but I think it's super cool that well, at least we can try now. Like we, before there wasn't really an option, right? you do it 10, 15 years ago, like there was no, I mean, we were still recording to tapes, like not even digital media, right? Like this was a, this is a fairly new trend that we have. And granted, there's been a lot of progress really fast and shout out to all the media guys that do all the hard work and, you know, destroy their $15,000 red cameras and, in, in you know, the mud and all this other stuff. Like uh, a lot of guys are working hard to do it. Um, but I think that there's going to be a point where we're going to have to really start looking at like cars are probably going to have to start getting made with options to accommodate media, like special camera mounts and wiring and, and all this stuff. Like people are going to start taking this stuff more seriously. Um, and the guys that think that way from the beginning, instead of adapting to it along the fly are going to really have some big wins when it comes to content. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, Ryan saw me working on uh, the Flaris Razor Pro R that Craig had. We probably had a hundred feet of cable on there just to get yeah. all that stuff set up. Yeah, and then all the wire from the Starlink on the helicopter was pretty yeah. wild. Too. Another 50 or so feet. Like, yeah, like, it's pretty crazy, man, the way that we have the opportunity to do it. But, I mean, there's a lot of technical know-how that goes into it. But the main fact is, like, it, as long as you know what you're doing, we get to produce the what we what we were never, uh, never able to do in the past. Like, to me, that is just insane just to have the opportunity to do that. Like, if I had known, because I'm kind of like what you guys said before, like, I didn't really know desert racing existed when I was doing dirt bikes and motocross and stuff. And like you said, Zach, you didn't know when you were living in Yuma that it existed. But now seeing that it exists, and we're in a time uh, in our lives and win the world that we can actually show it to other people, dude, that's insanely cool. So I think it's super important that we also have a conversation with the community about what they enjoy and what they what they want to see and, and what their questions are and what their perspectives are, because a lot of times we get so siloed into our own, like, just camps of thought that we don't really understand what everybody's actually looking for, um, especially when we're small teams that don't have big think groups and, and leadership to really push things in one direction or another. Um, and I think that's the greatest thing about social media is tie into media, right? Like we can, we can put something out five seconds after we recorded it and get the feedback from it and, and make adjustments on the fly where big productions can't do that. They can't take their camera ops off the wired, you know, fiber that they have ran to the team or whatever. They have to stick to the game plan. Whereas, uh, something like this, where it's more organic, we have the freedom to move around and adapt on the fly. Yeah, actually, Ryan's super good at that. He taught me a whole bunch about social media and stuff this weekend. Um, man, like we would produce stuff and you'd be like, yeah, this is what we're going to do for tomorrow. And you get ideas like it's pretty cool. Yeah, there. I mean, we're, we just live in a world now where, again, social media is kind of king. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it, they've made it to where there's sort of a system and, you know, you kind of got to know how to do it nowadays. And I don't think it's rocket science, but 
you know, you have to really pay attention and see what works. And, and, you know, again, I, I think if it's looked at like from a business standpoint, you know, these platforms, they're businesses, they want to do what they have to do to make money. Yep. So, you know, when they suggest a new feature, they want you to use it. And if you use it, they're probably going to reward you for it. Zach knows really well about that. too. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's, and I also think that's a deal where, you know, if more of the community starts to, you know, dabble into the media world and, you know, I, I hire a whole production team or yeah. a film crew when you're, again, you're just trying to get your car to the finish line. So when you guys um, went down there, um, you know, what were some of the assumptions and some of the things you learned that you had to change on the fly that made, you know, things work better for for what you were trying to do and the teams you were trying to support? The whole thing was a learning. Yeah. <laughs> the whole thing was a, a, a learning curve for sure. From, uh, I think most of the stuff that we had to change on the fly was the organizational portion of it or the people portion of it. The technology stuff, I mean, honestly, it was pretty much all set. Like we had it dialed before we went down there, except for that little 1%, the Starlink's not working in motion. Like had they worked in motion, I think we probably would have got a better gauge on what we could have done better with the people. But just having the people and the communication and stuff was the most difficult portion of it because it's like uh, herding cattle, right? You got to herd everybody. So it's really, I think that portion of it is going to be one of the, I mean, you mentioned it before, Zach, is going to be one of the integral parts of it. Um, but no matter what we do, even if that communication gets scattered, you're still showing the experience of Baja and that's never been done. So it's going to be, uh, whether it's a, a million percent success or a hundred percent success, whatever it is, it's still going to be a success because it's never been done. I think one of the cool things that we can look forward to, um, is the idea of customizable experiences. Um, the one thing that I liked that hammer started doing the ultra four production teams, um, shout out to all those guys. There's a lot of, <laughs> independents that come together to work for those guys um, is the idea that they have a couple different live streams that you can tune into. One's the produce side where we have the interaction and the people talking and, and all that stuff. And then you have, you know, maybe a different feed that's just the live shot of the car or whatever, just the helicopter feed or just the drone feed or whatever. I think there's an opportunity for us to really kind of see a future where it's like, yeah, we're going to have our people stream and then we're going to have our car stream and our heli stream and you can tune into whatever side you want. And, you know, maybe that's a pay-per-view type deal or, you know, whatever, but, uh, there's, there's a lot of options that come to play when we start talking about being able to just the ability to stream, right? If you can just get the bits to the internet, the, the opportunities become endless. Dude, that's actually pretty cool. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Like, yeah, so absolutely. here I am so making, uh, like making so. money for you in the future, just giving it out for free. Well, I, I think I'm still going to focus on what we're doing just to so <laughs> ace it first, but, um, that would be cool. Like just to have, cause like, uh, I mean, I know a million people that like, you know, I commentated for the mint 400 and I got tons of comments come in to say, dude, it'd be better if you didn't talk. <laughs> cool. You just want to watch, you just want to watch the racing. Well, yeah, dude, do it. I mean, that, yeah that's interesting but, you could just turn the volume down though yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> instead of being a jerk and telling me that but yeah but, uh, you know, george i didn't it, say that i enjoy listening to you <laughs> he's like i take it back no i, did. I didn't think you were gonna call me on that <laughs> no there was actually a bunch of people that were commenting in but anyways that, that that's that's your to, to your point it's teach their own but it opens up a ton of doors Dude, hundred percent. Thanks, Zach, for the idea. <laughs> so, uh, Ryan, give us a little background on who you are, where you've come from, and and uh, we kind of just went straight into talking about stuff. But uh, let us, let the listeners that don't know who you are, and and obviously you're not a huge public figure or anything like that. So, give us some background, give us some knowledge, and uh, let us know who you are. What do you What do you mean? You haven't heard? Yeah, of you're me, massive. Man? Yeah, I, I thought I was like one of the most well-known people in California. Well, your poster uh, is above my bed, but we won't go into that. I could thank you. See, that's, I, that's all I wanted to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I am, um, I am a pretty much full blown moto media guy. Um, I, I'm still sort of trying to find, um, 
my set path, right? So I have a podcast um, where we bring in a lot of moto guests and um, what's it called? The Insiders Podcast. Man, thank you, George. I yeah, we can't be missing this opportunity okay. here. You, uh, I set you all yeah. up and then you just start dropping. Come on. I just, I just missed the alley oop. Yeah. Dude, the media guy almost <laughs> blew it. I, yeah. See, um, I'm not, see, I'm not usually a guest also. I'm not used to talking about myself. I'm usually doing this to somebody else. So, um, yeah, I, I have a podcast called the Insiders Podcast on, um, on the Media Pub YouTube channel and Spotify. And, um, yeah, like I said, we we try to just give a platform for, you know, amateur motocross dudes, free ride motocross guys, professionals, um, sort of an opportunity to get their personality out there, you know, not from such a corporate standpoint. So um, there's nothing wrong with all the other moto podcasts that, you know, sort of do it the more professional, clean style, I guess. Um, but I like to dig into, you know, what these guys story are, you know, what drove them to get to where they are instead of just talking racing all the time. Um, so I grew up racing dirt bikes. I've got hurt a lot. I, you know, I've dabbled back into it nowadays as I've gotten older and live in the Mecca of it. Um, I came from New York. I moved out here about three years ago and just trying to, trying to create cool content that, uh, is within our budget yeah and that's one of the reasons that i like ryan so much zach is because he does it a little bit different and it aligns with the same concepts that i want to produce for media stuff so getting down to uh baja what was like your prep for that like george you've been there down you've been down there a bunch so you had a lot of probably assumptions but you know as far as working with ryan and ryan how you approached it like what was some of the prep going down with such a grandiose idea that we're going to build out this, this live stream thing. Uh, what was some of the thought process into prepping for that? I mean, I guess I could answer that from a, a pretty high level, but why don't you go first? Um, I mean, I just knew that either way, um, you know, we kind of knew going into it that the live stream was, you know, could go really good, could, could go really bad. Um, either way, I knew my job was to, hit the record button every time and worse comes to worse. If it wasn't being shown live, like how we wanted it to, we at least had it there ready to go out, you know, in post, um, preparing wise. I mean, I just knew that I was going to be riding around in a helicopter with, uh, somebody I've never met before and, <laughs> and hope that it, you know, went well, luckily Derek's one of the best in the game and he made it super comfortable. Um, but it's yeah, wild. The like, preparation for that is totally different than what I'm used not to. Not to get off track, Zach, but like, uh, and I'll answer your question about the preparation stuff. But when you have a good team and good stuff like happening behind you, it makes it like your job easy. I can't tell you how many times Ryan was sitting in the helicopter filming and he goes, Derek, you just gave me the most fire shot. And I didn't even have to think about it. Like, cause Derek's driving the helicopter, flying the helicopter and twisting and, and seeing where he's going and looking and all the safety stuff. But then he's positioning the helicopter over the car perfectly. Like those types of things make it so that you don't even think about how much trouble you would have if you didn't have that option. Yeah. He, he made it incredibly easy because uh, you know again to touch on your point he would he would fly over and make it to where as long as i was just pointing straight out of the window and pretty much kept the object in center of frame i mean he was he was doing all the work like but at one point he even said you know he's our, he's at the point now where just cruising a heli around for him is kind of boring. Like he wants to be setting up shots like that to try to challenge fun. him, dude. Yeah, to make it fun <laughs> and interesting. So that probably speaks a little bit on where he is talent wise driving a helicopter. So yeah, it's like it, it's cool to have those like talented people, right, Zach, on your on your team. Um, and then uh, do you want to ask another question or you want me to go into the technical stuff? No, I think uh I think shout out to the helicopter the helicopters the helicopter pilots uh, that support our industry, right? Like optic, you know, he, he didn't really have, he wasn't exposed to our industry 
until the last few years where he started really pushing into glam and started really pushing into Havasu, started really getting involved. Well, with... that's just his business, though. He was a that's just his business, though. He was a uh, desert dirt bike racer. Right. So he but, knows the vibe. But what I'm saying, as far as like just our industries, like I think back to the old days where I was involved with snowmobile industry and stuff like that, like getting a helicopter involved in your photo shoot or your video shoot was like was like mind blowing, huge deal for everybody involved. Like if, if nothing else during the year, you did zero other things. Like the one thing you wanted to do was be involved with a photo shoot that had the helicopter. Like that was the biggest deal. Um, but now we have a whole lot more of investment from private companies and helicopter pilots and, and these different resources that are more involved with our community and now are willing to come out and do things with our community. Um, it really provides a unique perspective and experience and a hype factor on our industry that we that most industries don't have you don't see you know a whole lot of other industries with a bunch of helicopters flying around all day long you know zipping above people's heads and around cars and, and doing crazy things i think the biggest reason is because you can't see it unless you're in the helicopter doing it like if uh if you're part of the chase crew you're gonna only get when they come by for five minutes or when they're in the pits like it's like that's it like so having the ability to have some sort of aerial photography or or videography is an insanely crucial piece to well to this production specifically but even to post production like yeah. stuff because you got to be able to see it right um it is however very difficult so when we talk about the planning and production and stuff like so we're kind of talking about the Starlinks and the media stuff, but there's a massive logistical thing that happens behind the scenes too for the chase trucks, for the race car, for the pitch strategy, for the people to eat, for fuel to get uh, put in the helicopter, when the helicopter takes off, when it lands, when it gets fuel. Like it's a massive, massive undertaking to get one car to the finish line. I don't think people yeah, really understand the biggest is. investment is in a lot of times can just be finding fuel. Like it's there, there's not an Exxon in the middle of the desert for you waiting for you just to show up and, and bring up a, a couple gallons of gas, right? Like, and then you start talking about helicopters that don't have standard locations. They have to land in the middle of nowhere. And then you have to have a truck and some barrels and some pumps. And like, it doesn't just magically get into the tank. <laughs> like there's a lot that goes into just making sure places and people and cars and helicopters are all fueled. Yeah, it's it's crazy how much there is going on behind it because, you know, even at one point we had we had a truck drive a can of fuel out for us, but where we landed and planned on having it fuel the helicopter back up was in a fenced in area and the truck couldn't even get in there, you know. So then it's a scramble of trying to find a new spot that the heli can safely land and that the truck can get to them to get fuel back into the thing mind you this is in the middle of the mexican desert right and meanwhile you know we just happen to be in a kind of a shitty spot where the only real flat spot we could get to was basically on the race course yeah so it, i mean it's it's a battle pretty much the entire time like there's so many things that go on behind the scenes that nobody really probably has any idea of so to give and, people yeah, some pers- shout out i was gonna say just give some people some perspective right. on how long the helicopter can be up before you have to refuel probably an hour and a half maybe yeah maybe, maybe a little less it just, it just depends how many how much fuel like we take off with because you got to remember too like the airports are only open a certain amount of time so like if you're going home and you're not at the airport to get more fuel before then the next day you start out with limited fuel and you have to find fuel and if you don't have fuel then you can't go anywhere like it's matt it, it's dude it's gnarly and you're following a race car if the race car has issues then you have to stop and you have to hover there for longer if the race car doesn't meet a certain point then your fuel changes like i don't even know how to say it but like everybody behind the scenes and all the stuff that those guys do and derek flying the helicopter those guys are just insanely good at all the logistical stuff so what were you what were you saying before I rudely interrupted you? Uh, no problem. Um, I was saying uh, shout out to Craig Scanlon too for leaving his uh, four seat pre runner uh, at the uh, the house or the compound that we were staying at too because we didn't have a battery for the fuel pump that we needed to put in the helicopter and we couldn't just go get a battery out of a car like an AutoZone or something because first of all we had to be at the in the air and second it weighs too much so those like three pounds matter. So we went and stole 
the battery out of Craig Scanlon's uh, UTV um, and put it in the helicopter to operate the fuel pump just so we could get fuel when we found a drum out in the middle of the desert. So there's so many little things that happen. I mean, like we couldn't even bring, like Derek was telling me in the helicopter, he's like, can you bring your iPad instead of your laptop? And I was like, because it weighs a pound more. And he's like, yeah, like <laughs> we got to like, we got to save weight. Yeah. That's another thing that I was just going to touch on is like, you know, just another crazy factor to throw into this thing is like, right. We're riding around in a small helicopter that can't hold that much weight. So, you know, I was literally debating on bringing an extra battery for my camera, which is this big, you know, just because if I bring a little bit too, too much extra, we're going to be over on weight and it's going to make it sketchy for him. And that's not really anything to play with. Nope. Yeah, it's wild, right, Zach? I think you guys just killed all my dreams of being able to go on a helicopter. I'm a little too big to fit, and I think... He did tell us that he had taken up somebody, I want to say, just shy of 300 pounds. Yeah, I mean, you could go on the helicopter, Zach, no problem. Uh, you I'll just have, have to, to kick you guys out. The... Yeah, you, he'll just kick us out, and then you can <laughs> uh, you can make sure that you bring the, the camera. Just have a GoPro on your head or some sort of Zoom camera on your head. And you can have a laptop in your seat, and then you can communicate on the radio with all your other appendages. You're good. <laughs> yeah, and just make sure you wear a, a shoot on your back just in case you have to jump. Yeah, just, just in case. Just in case you got to get out. <laughs> Was there any, or did you guys have any mo- moments where you were kind of hanging out the window with the camera and just thinking, oh my God, this is about to go real bad? Do you have any? Well, no. So let me preface this. Derek's helicopter is a closed helicopter, so that's the way he chooses to do it. But it's got a bunch of big windows, so it doesn't really impede your vision. Um, But uh, the only one, like, there was maybe one time we were going into the wind that we, like, uh, got that, like, dropping gut feeling. But other than that, he's, dude, it was smooth. Yeah, I I was going to say, me being a little bit of a little girl, um, Saturday morning when we are flying into those massive canyons and the, the wind was pretty gnarly, like, it... It just it raises some questions in the brain in the moment, right? Like you look around and you you just have these massive walls of mountains, and you know a big gust of wind comes through and you start shaking, and you know again you don't know what's going to happen. Like there was one point where I I wanted to ask Derek, like, hey, is this anything to worry about? But I I didn't really want to ask that, over, yeah, you know, over the radio, but. I also just trusted that he knew what he was doing. And again, he, you know, he knew when to back out of it and take us the long way around. Yeah. So that's one good thing to talk about actually is like Ryan was just saying, Zach is like, we were flying into the directly into the wind in the morning on Saturday morning. And it was really stressing the helicopter. Like it was eating a lot of fuel. We were only going like 30 miles an hour on land. Like it was just pushing and pushing and like, you don't want to rev over rev the helicopter. You don't want to push it too hard. And Derek made the executive decision to basically turn around and go all the way around the mountains. Like we probably lost, well, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes just driving around that. We lost a lot yeah. of fuel. Um, That's but, the biggest thing is the fuel you're losing yeah. trying to get there. Cause then you're only left with a little bit to work with. But as many helicopter pilots that are in the sky during those races, most of the guys are all thinking about that, man. And they're making sure that everybody is safe, dude. It's wild. Yeah. And the, you, you mentioned how many helicopters there's, just, there's so, I, I heard a few different people from, from Baja talking about how many helicopters were flying around. And, you know, when I was down at the mint, you know, it's cool seeing three, four helicopters flying around chasing cars or whatever, but in Baja with so many drawn out racers and how far apart everybody is, there's gotta be such a huge team. And, We've talked about earlier just how many logistical, you know, nightmares are involved with putting on a production like that with times however many helicopters, times however many teams, times however many whatevers. Um, Is there anything that happened down in Baja that, like, as an industry, we could learn from? Mm, Like, nothing bad. I think that everybody learns every time they go down there. And, uh, I mean, like... I learned a whole bunch like Derek and the vision and the the amount of stuff that he can see in the sky compared to what dudes like us can see. Mm -hmm. Like there was times when he saw a helicopter and then like I had to take like 
a minute and a half or 60 seconds to look for it. And I was like, oh, there it is. And Just Derek a was tiny like, little dot. Yeah, yeah, like a little dot. And Derek's like, yeah, I saw it a while ago. Mm-hmm. So like those types of things, like those guys are professionals, man. It's really, it's nice to be able to be around those good pilots. There's definitely a, an element to production, um, whether that be live or even just post, that working with high quality people and talent and have a mindset and understand and and do all that, which speaks to the next question I had for Ryan was, you know, just being so involved in motor sports as far as uh, motocross and, and dirt bikes and stuff. Um, you know, what was some of your takeaways on what did you learn about uh, filming off-road cars versus uh, doing dirt bike tracks and things like that? Um, there's... There's a lot of differences, even though you're sort of dealing with the same thing, right? Um, you know, I've, I've learned in the past, even before this race, um, that these things are no joke and they go really fast. And, you know, if anything happens or if they get out of control, um, you know, they're really not anything to test or play with to where, you know, ideally you don't want a dirt bike flying off the track and coming at you either. But at least if that does happen, you have a lot more leeway to either get out of the way or if you do get hit, it's probably not going to be as bad if you get hit by a truck. You know what I'm saying? Um, so it, you just have to be cautious. You have to definitely know your surroundings. You have to pay attention to what's going on around you. Yeah, dude, they can get gnarly super quick. Yeah. Um, but Zach, to go back on what you were saying before, like with the question of like the preparation and stuff, um, you can only prep so much to be like safe, right? You just have to know your surroundings while you're dealing with them. And you have to be flexible and you have to be uh, diligent about what you're doing. And all the media guys have to do that. I mean, otherwise you can get yourself into some serious trouble. So talking about how media is playing a bigger a more important role with race teams and um, athletes that need sponsorship and just in general, the need for media. Um, what can you guys offer is like maybe some tips for guys that are trying to do desert racing or just production for their business at all. Um, what are some of those tips that you mentioned earlier about like social media and really needing to understand how it works and, and, and implement what is available to you and, and all that stuff. Um, any tips you have for some of these um, teams that are now adopting that methodology of creating content on the regular, getting out to races and creating content? Because a lot of teams don't have, you know, resources for, resources for two, three, four photographers, plus an editor, plus a, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, what kind of simple takeaways can they have to maximize their impact while they're at these events? Well, Ryan's going to be better at answering this than me. All I'm going to say is just be yourself, like no matter what you do, even if it's your phone. Just video yourself with your phone or have your family or friends or whoever's down there, your dad with you. Um, and just be yourself, man. Showcase what you think is cool. Because whatever you think is cool, more than likely other people are going to think it's cool too. Yeah, I mean, um, luckily, almost everybody has one of these things, right? And nowadays, if you have one of these things, you can create just as much content as you know somebody like us who has cameras and, you know, the equipment for it. So um, also the good thing about these platforms is they almost reward iPhone content because it's super relatable to people. So, you know, my my suggestion to any team that is just trying to start out and dabble into the media world is, you know, grab your 14 or 15 or 16 year old son or, you know, somebody who has an iPhone and is, down to be there and just have them start grabbing clips and photos and start making reels. And, you know, again, these platforms want you to use the resources that they are providing. Yeah. Right. So, you know, hammer out reels. And one of the things George and I were talking about on the way home was, you know, it's, it's easy to go really hard on just one of these platforms, right. It's really easy to just go hard on Instagram. But we have Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, you know, now all these platforms are putting way more effort into their short duration content and they're even paying. So, you know, take that same video that you made for Instagram and upload it to YouTube shorts and then upload that same thing to TikTok and upload that same thing to Snapchat highlights or whatever. And 
get it out to as many people as you possibly can. It's, it's okay. If you know, some of the same eyes are seeing that video twice, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But you, you wouldn't have got that if, cause some people aren't on TikTok that are on it or vice versa. Exactly. Even Facebook, Facebook is still a huge platform and now they offer reels as well. So, you know, we have these free platforms, these free opportunities to put our content out to people. And again, you don't have to have thousand dollars, you know, but cameras that are worth thousands and thousands of dollars, you don't need it. it helps, but you don't always need it. So, you know, my suggestion is to just go out and start grabbing content, just take clips of the, you know, the truck or the vehicle or whatever it is before the race, you know, show that you're out there. Thank your sponsors that you do have and just post content and if and you see post, what works for you. And if you post content that works, like when you're out there eating tacos and you're doing taco reviews and stuff, please share that with me because I will consume the shit out of that content. <laughs> yeah. And I'll also, um, I'll also learn from it and take your opinion and to yeah, consideration. And go, eat, and go eat those tacos at that spot. Yeah. Cause yep. I, I'm all for a good taco review. Yep. I, I think uh, one thing that we've said multiple times on the, on the show, when it comes to sponsorships or just in general for people getting started is, is just to start. And like you were saying, like, the first step in, in getting content out there and being successful is to start, whether that's crappy content, whether that's cheesy content, whether that's really awesome content, it doesn't matter. You have to start at some point and start putting stuff out there and you have to learn and, and adapt over time. Uh, but one of the biggest tips that I've had um, given people over the last, I don't know, six to eight, 10 months is it doesn't have to be high produced. Like there's so much content to be put out there that you don't have to have a fully edited piece of content to go out on reels or into Facebook or YouTube or whatever, it can literally be from your phone. It can be from um, just the quick effort that you put into it. And most times the effort to put into the moment versus the high produced content uh, will have a better payoff for you anyways. So like you were saying, getting your phone out, doing the taco thing, showing the team, showing the community, showing uh, you know the trials and the tribulations of racing and you know, admit to when something broke and admit to when, you know, you're struggling and, and then show your wins and excitement and, you know, getting up at 2 a.m. And, and all that stuff. All that content is almost more valuable than any produced piece of content you can put out there because it's bringing the community closer to you. And when the community is close to you, the sponsors are, are wanting to promote that and be a part of what you're producing. Yeah, I won't say that quality doesn't matter because quality is still important. Like, oh, for sure. Ryan will produce 10 times better quality than I ever will. But the story and the moment is always the best, most important part. Yeah. And the benefit to it coming from an iPhone, you know, is a lot of times the iPhone gives it the vibe that it was recorded right then and it was put out right after. No yeah. editing and authentic it's super authentic and sometimes with a you know a produced production based piece you know there's times that it can unintentionally look scripted if yeah. that makes sense you know um because again it went into an editing program and somebody chopped it all up to sort of make it look how they wanted to to where again if you know back to like what you're saying if you're just capturing the the rawness the waking up at 2 a.m and dealing with the you know all the crazy shit that happens along the way it's super relatable people see the rawness in it they see that it's truthful and it's natural man zach I, like just listening to you guys talk about this stuff like makes me feel like that the live broadcast when we figure it out or when we do produce it is going to be so much more valuable because I, like we're just capturing the moment there's like mm -hmm. you're not edited it's it's there. Yeah, I think that's truly a game changer. I think the the conversation that needs to happen in like technical world is the tools that people are consuming through, right? Like when you're out producing a live stream that starts on, let's just say Friday morning and ends on Saturday afternoon, uh, you know, people only have so much time to dedicate to a stream or to a video or whatever. Um, and in social media, when you're doing the short clips, like, you can catch something now, you can catch something tomorrow, but you don't always see everything chronologically, right? The algorithms are pushing things in a, in a weird way where you don't necessarily see the storyline happen in a linear fashion, um, like a lot live stream would force you to do. So I think the interesting thing that, um, you know, I would really like to hopefully see in the near future is 
a way for our tools to better present content to us. And I hope that over time, those things adapt because I think that's going to be the, the Achilles heel for all of us trying to create this linear stream of content for our consumers um, is, is trying to figure out how to keep it relatable, even though that they're in an hour late or they've been all day or, you know, six hours later, it doesn't, doesn't really always work out with the current algorithms. Yeah. And that's one of the things that like, I think Ryan is good, especially with our team is um, because like, let's just say we are busy doing the live production or whatever it is. Uh, if his camera is off for 10 minutes or we're doing something else, he can sit that like just get social bangers and just like slap it out there or whatever it is. Cause all that stuff is valuable. And then at the end of the day, literally at the end of the day, when people are consuming their content, it doesn't matter with all the contents there and you can guide them to whatever platform it is. So all of it really ends up being good when you're executing on all those levels that Ryan and I have just been to, and you've been talking about. So uh, let's circle to some fun stuff. What was your favorite moments down in Baja this year? Man, there was a ton of favorite moments. Like to me, it's following the stories. Like I'm clearly getting tacos is like all time for me. But like after that, like the um, the stories and seeing the experiences and stuff. Like I've been down there a few times, and it's just every single time it's better and better and better because of how pumped and the vibe is just so high. Like I I can't explain to you. Like I just want to show it to you guys. <laughs> so hopefully the live feed works out pretty good. I think some of the special moments for us where uh, we stayed at a compound that had uh, had some history to it, we'll just say. Definitely some history. Had me, uh, we so, a little bit of sleep at night. Yeah, so um, we went exploring for ghosts, let's just say that. <laughs> so did you find any Sorry, uh, but, uh, racers past walking to hallways? No, man, it was, it was crazy. Like, it was, uh, it was just a crazy thing to do. Like, and to be able to see that and like understand that we were um, staying at a place that was like that. And I don't know, just to, I don't really even know how you want to put it, but. It's a unique experience that you just can't of, get anywhere else. And it's unique for everybody that goes like not everyone has the same experience down in, in Mexico for the, any of the Baja races. Yeah, exactly. I would definitely agree with that. Man. We even had people like telling us like their stories that like in tech and contingency and stuff. Actually, that was probably one of your favorite times when we got to go walk tech, huh? Yeah, that was cool. Honestly, I think one of my favorite times was the like the finish line mm -hmm. and seeing everybody come across. And, you know, Craig was a little bit bummed because, you know, he, he, win. he's a racer and he yeah. wants to win. Um, and that's cool to see, too. You know, there's a lot of guys that race this race that they just want to finish. Yep. Just finishing is a win. And and I fully understand that. I you know, after seeing this race firsthand, I don't know if there's a, a number of money that would make me want to race that race. It's like, so gnarly. It's so gnarly. And even, you know, I'm a moto dude. I, I have no problem going to Glen Helen and busting out some motos. But how about those moto guys that were Iron Manning that whole thing and, and finish the race? Insane. I mean, I, I seen some clips literally this morning of some of the moto guys tracking through that. And it is some crazy stuff. Like the cojones on these guys are your brain would mass smoke. Oh, um, everything that goes into it. And then the, the length of the time that you're on the bike and having to ride at night. And, you know, I seen a clip on Instagram this morning or last night of one section where in dark, they could not see the turn and they were just going off of a cliff. Yeah. And did just, you see that? Yeah. Yeah. And that was crazy. Cars that it happened to, but that was like a booby trap too. Cause the locals were shining lights in their eyes. Just another factor. Of Baja. <laughs> like, it's, crazy. it's crazy. There's really nothing like it. So Zach, I think actually I got a better answer now for some of my favorite parts is like, we had a podcast on the dirt life last night, talking with a bunch of the racers and stuff and understanding the stories and the experiences that they all had down there. I think that's one of my favorite parts is like, I wish that I could be around every single team and every, every, but listen to everybody's stories because everybody has a different experience, but they're all the same. They're all happy and awesome experiences. Yeah. I think one cool thing that comes out of Baja is it, almost exactly what you said. Everybody leaves with their own story. Mm -hmm. And I feel like everybody that goes to Baja leaves with an epic story. Dude, epic. Yeah. I think that, 
it would be super cool. Like you, if if you look, follow some of the bigger racers that have some of the bigger media teams, they'll do like a post race edit on like the whole storyline from beginning to end. And the ones that I thoroughly enjoy are the ones that are like literally talking to the guy with the camera, being like, "This really is struggling right now. Like this is a hard thing for us to accomplish. We're really, you know, we're working through it. This is what we found to to find a solution for it." And then, you know, they, they work their way into succeeding at it and, and the other, whatever else comes down the way. And then all of a sudden at the end of the finish line, um, or not, um, you know, the authentic conversation between those that are in the moment and me, the consumer of the content, the guys that do that the best are the ones that I'm like, I'll sit here and watch the whole thing straight from the beginning to end. I won't scrub. I won't skip. I won't do anything because those are the conversations. Those are the stories that I really connect with. Dude, I agree 100%. So we actually talked with, uh, it's a, a class 11, which is the Volkswagen bug class last night, a, a team called GHA Racing. And they technically got a DNF uh, or a didn't finish for the race, but they did. They crossed the finish line 36 hours and I think two minutes. And I think the cutoff time was 36 hours. Oh, so, no way. Yeah, so they just got there like, um, but all of the stories, I mean, like each individual person had their own stories, but they had so many stories along the way. They could have wrote a book just on mm-hmm. one race and like they fixed their bug and they blew it out and they passed for the lead. And they were like hauling ass, like all these crazy things, dude. It was just so intense to see. Like I left, like just hearing their stories with a massive smile on my face. Like it was, you know, hard for me to go to sleep basically because i was so into what they were talking about about their race and that's just one team dude and there's hundreds of them yeah and and looping back to like what you said um you know i think that's a little bit of the window that this sport is missing right is like you know what you just said is you think some of the coolest stories are you know the ones where they're just being raw and natural and telling you the struggles that they're going through and none of it's sugar-coated I don't, I don't know for sure, but I, if I could guess, ninety nine point nine percent of the teams that race about how one thousand did not have a perfect story. Dude, yeah, I would, dude. No, I was looking at the roster or the the finish sheet, mm-hmm. and there was probably a good forty to fifty percent that didn't even make it to the finish line. Right. So, I mean, if you were to just go through every single one of those teams' stories from start to finish, and and hear what they had to go through you're going to have a ton of bitch and storylines with a lot of entertainment. In it. Dude, and just, I, I think that if that was, you know, again, like back to what you said, if we got to hear more of those start to finish stories and, you know, a minute and, or a minute and 30 seconds, and it was all summarized, but had the most dramatic parts of the trip in there, then, you know, I think you're hitting a gold line from an entertainment standpoint, like I think any person would be into watching some of the shit that these guys have to go through to make it. Dude, then, okay, that's perfect, Zach. So to answer your question on giving people advice on the content, share those stories, man, so we can all watch them. Yeah, I, I think that there's definitely an opportunity for any race team personality, even just the family that has, you know, a channel that they want to put content out, you know, getting out and experiencing and translating what you're thinking and feeling in the moment. Uh, no matter what it is, whether that be side by sides, moto, you know, track racing, any of that stuff, uh, the 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 less of us in the shots and in, in the in the story, and the more of the car or the whatever, the more sterile it becomes, right? And the more yeah. we can be a part of the conversation, uh, you know, I think everyone's going to win, including anyone that has brands to represent or sponsors or anything like that. And so it would be super cool to to team up with a whole bunch of different content capturer. I want to say capturers, but because they're, they're, they're creating the content, but they're not producing the content. They're just capturing the content. The, they have a team of like one or two guys with every single team and then put together like a Netflix series. That's like every episode is a different team, you know? And then at the end of the, of the series is like the recap of the entire thing or something. That would be super cool. It'd be epic. I think that, I think what you could get out of something like that is like legitimately Netflix, level content because again the stuff that some of these guys have to go through is just absurd and again i don't want to keep beating a dead horse with it but you know for anybody that wants to get out and create content to loop it back around again like 
exactly what George said. Like, that's sort of your golden ticket. Like, get, capture the rawness, capture the all the gnarliest shit. And again, you can do it with your iPhone, yep. which a lot of times in the gnarly sort of high stress situations, it's the easiest way to c- capture shit is with your iPhone because it's not so like in your face and you're not going to have people like, Hey, don't film this, you know? So if anybody ever asked what the best camera is, the best camera is the one that's in your pocket. hundred percent. The one you already have on you. Yep. And I had someone ask me about, you know, action cameras, do they even matter anymore and stuff like that. And it's like, go like a GoPro has gone so far as far as technology goes that as long as you can just put it somewhere and turn it on, it's worth it. Like it's not worth it to record four hours of the car, not moving, but, in the idea of content capture, if you can, if you can put it somewhere and record it, you're going to be able to use that for something. Um, and the image quality and the, and the colors and everything are all so good now that, you know, between an iPhone and an action camera, you can have a pretty good, um, setup for any, any team or any kind of group of racers. Yeah, I agree. The dirt life is a massive fan of GoPros and iPhones. The dirt life doesn't even have a full frame camera. <laughs> in his stock in his stable you got like a uh, super duper double stacked gopro live stream setup going on yeah we do have a lot of gopros that's for sure yeah gopro wants to uh reach out and send georgie here a box they've done it before <laughs> so we're going oh, to yeah. shout out to gopro yeah uh but let's go back to what you were talking about zach because um i gotta get going i actually have to go test drive a supercharged pro r up at norco so um <laughs> Sounds rough. I know. Dude, <laughs> tell me about it. And I'm going to get tacos too. So my life is complete Tuesdays. I went to, uh, but- I drove in a, a supercharged KRX and a supercharged turbo or pro R um, in Utah. It was pretty, pretty rad. Um, who can you say who you're going out to, to ride with or uh, maybe afterwards I can. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, how was that KRX supercharged? That'd be sweet. So supercharged, it puts, they were using about eight pounds on it and it was putting down in the neighborhood of like 140 horse or something like that. Um, but we were, we were putting, um, we were doing roost on 35 rock crawlers, um, in the sand. So if that says anything, Damn, was it snapping belts or was it good? Nope. It, the, I mean, stock clutch, stock belt, stock, everything, except for it had 35 Zillas and we were throwing sand around. It was pretty awesome. Dude, that is super cool. Uh, but I, you, I wanted to answer a question that you asked quite a bit ago, like maybe half an hour ago, but you said what kind of preparation went into this? Like, I don't want to scare anybody away from creating the content, but just to produce the live feed, I have hundreds and hundreds of hours, well over 220 hours worth of work going into just getting things prepared and getting things set up for the live feed. You have to build servers. You have to build things that ingest the content, that digest the content, that push out the content, like all kinds of different crazy stuff. But I will say that it's all going to be worth it in the long run once it happens, because I'm not doing this just for me. I'm doing it because I want to excel the off-road industry. And I think that once this stuff starts coming to fruition, we're going to see a massive change and a massive growth spurt. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's definitely, um, I don't think everybody should have live stream ambitions. I think it's unrealistic, but you know, as far as um, creating content on their own, just staying in the moment and posting the content is the biggest win you can have uh, and leave the live stream uh, stuff up to the crazy people like us that want to play with technology and, and (laughs) expend the resources to, to try new things. Dude, yeah, and like what Ryan was saying, if you have a phone and you're in the United States, you're doing your local race, dude, just get a mount from Amazon for 10 bucks and put that thing in your car and like just throw it on Facebook Live. Yeah, for sure. And even like the action cameras can now wirelessly broadcast, right? Like the GoPro can go live on off of your phone or whatever. So um, yeah, lots of cool options out there for everybody. Um, Ryan, where can we find you and your podcast and all those different things? Uh, so my YouTube channel is the media pub and, um, you can find our podcast underneath that. Again, that's called the insiders. You can also find the insiders podcast on Spotify. Um, that is also under the media pub. So it's a little confusing. Um, but yeah, my Instagram is at underscore Ryan Ritter, R Y A N R I T T E R and the media pub Instagram fully firing every day try to post some funny stuff try to post some uh some banger stuff and yeah 
we're we're fully firing all the time dude for all the side by side guys go check out some of the stuff that he produced for they put up on his instagram and the at scanlon motorsports instagram dude because ryan killed it this weekend just killed it i was gonna say you know where can we where can we see the fruits of some of this effort as far as uh, the non-live stream the post-edited stuff where can we follow to see some of the work that happened uh, this last week in baja I would say probably either go to the media pub uh, like Ryan's or go to like at Scanlon Motorsports has most of it um, because there's a shitload of content up there. So um, that's most of the stuff that we produce. You can also check out uh, at the Dirt Life show and uh, go over there and check out some of the stuff, too, because I put in some stuff there. And if you want to just see tacos and shit, go to mine. It's George Hamill. (laughs) We got to get you started on the dedicated taco channel like your buddy that does tacos every day. Um. (laughs) Dude, So in Wildemar, my buddy uh, Will, he's uh, he's he's called the taco slayer. He's been doing tacos every single day for every meal for the last, I think he's on his 450th day, I think. So like three and a half years now, man, that's impressive. I don't know if I could do tacos every day. He lives by Greer. Like he's, he's hiking Greer all the time. If I could do pizza every day, dude, big pizza guy here, Zach. (laughs) I could do pizza every day. Yeah. I don't know. I think pizza taco might work. Oh, now you're thinking, I like your style. I like your style. All right, guys, uh, that'll do it for this episode of the podcast. Uh, you can find uh, Ryan online at the Media Pub. You can find George at the Dirt Live Show. Uh, also, they both have their own personal accounts. You can find our show on Apple, Spotify, iHeart, all the different places. Uh, follow us on YouTube to watch these beautiful men uh, sit next to each other the entire time and put up with my ramblings. Um, and uh, for the next time, guys, uh, give us a like and a subscribe and a share if you could. Otherwise, follow our channels. We've got lots of good content coming out. We just put out on our channel the uh, Holiday Gift Guide, uh, the Black Friday, Cyber Monday Deal Guide, all sorts of different resources for you guys out there. And then um, follow these guys and Scanlon and Polaris and all these different companies that have content coming out from the fruits of these guys. Um, But until the next time, guys, enjoy the happy holidays. Stay safe out there. Hold on. Hold on. I want to say it for Christmas, too. The guys at Boxo Tools just said that uh, I could offer the side by side guys audience the code Dirt Life to go over to Boxo Tools and save a whole bunch of money if anybody's interested in tools for your holiday gift guide. Nice. We just did a um, uh, the holiday uh, gift guide, and on there was the Boxo UTV roll that has all the tools in a roll up bag. Um, and so that was actually uh, not even like me. It was somebody from the community recommended uh, the Boxo Tool Wrap. So if you want to get one of those, uh, use the Dirt Life, just the Dirt Life. Is it Dirt Life? The uh, code? I think it's just Dirt Life, D-I-R-T-L-I-F-E. And you can save on that and you can see Ryan repping the shirt. You can get merch on George's website. Uh, no, you, you any- can't. The merch is only for athletes and VIPs. Ooh. Burn. So I don't have Man. anything. So I got two. I got two hats waiting for you, bud. <laughs> nice. Um, so check them out. Dirt Life Show. Is it DirtLifeShow.com? Uh, the dirt life show.com. There you go. And, uh, sorry to mess up your outro, dude. <laughs> You're ruining my flow. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, hope everybody has a safe and happy holidays. Spend some time with your family. Make sure to put your phone down for at least 10 minutes. Give everybody a hug and, uh, don't let anyone get out there drinking and driving. Always have a DD. And until the next time, guys, peace. Peace.